And this time when we're all celebrating being back together face to face, we're also going to celebrate that we have learned to use technology and uh, uh, technology is going to allow us to uh, have our next session uh, featuring the National Academy of Sciences. Joining us remotely is Dr. Marsha McNutt, President of the National Academy of Sciences, and she's going to be interviewed by Dr. Kim Orth of UT Southwestern, a TAMIS board member from the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. McNutt, thank you for joining us, and Dr. Orth, thank you for leading the conversation. Hi. Oh, I see you. Okay. <laughs> I think they'll put you down here as well. Hi. So I'm Kim Orth. I'm a professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center and an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And today we are joined virtually by Dr. Marsha McNutt. And she is um, the president of the National Academy of Sciences. And um, thank you for your time and your valued opinions. Marsha McNutt is a geophysicist. She has served as the editor-in-chief of the Science Family of Journals. She's the director of the U.S. Geological Survey and as president-in-chief and executive officer of the Monterey Bay Aquarium of Research Institutes. We both share the love of scuba diving, I found out. <laughs> she is a professor of geophysics and MIT, and she has also served as the president of the American uh, Geophysical Union. And so today, Dr. McNutt and I will discuss the scientific response to COVID-19 pandemic and what the next phases of the disease could look like. We also will discuss relevant national and international contemporary issues important to the National Academy of Sciences. At the end of our conversation, we'll have time for the audience to ask some questions. So Marcia. The first topic that we'd like to discuss with you or hear your opinions about is COVID-19. Learning to live with COVID-19, how to navigate new variants and waves. Society has eliminated two infectious diseases before, smallpox and bovine flu. COVID could end up in the category of flu. What are the interventions, policies, and treatments that will allow us to learn to live with COVID? How does life go on? Well, thank you, Kim, for that question. Uh, are you hearing me okay? Just yes, give me a thumbs up. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, well, first of all, I am somewhat out of my depth in talking too much about COVID as a disease because, it, as it was clear from your introduction, I'm not an infectious disease expert. But I have dealt with many uh, crises and slow-moving crises. Uh, such as COVID, uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill, climate change, et cetera. And these are uh, all issues which required uh, novel science and um, new ways of providing um, advice to, to governments. What's, um, what's obvious now, and I, I just have to talk about my own naivete at the start of COVID. I was thinking, Scientists are going to come up with a uh, with a vaccine for this, and we're going to beat COVID, and it's going to be like mumps or measles, that it's just some rare thing that crops up in pockets of unvaccinated people. But for the most part, um, typically people who have been vaccinated go on with their daily lives, and there's no problem. Well, that clearly was not the way that this pandemic uh, played out. We have seen instead that the virus is constantly mutating, and it's mutating in two specific ways. One is like most viruses, it is uh, becoming perhaps less lethal in time. We don't see the, the large numbers of deaths with the new variants, but of course we've also learned how to treat COVID better. So it's sometimes hard to disentangle those two. But the other thing that, that a virus does is it uh, evolves in a way to try to evade our immune protections that we've either developed or uh, given ourselves through uh, vaccines. And that's why we're seeing some people get COVID several times. So uh, in learning to live with the disease, I put as number one on our agenda 
is just an overall improvement in public health. Mm -hmm. We've seen that those who are most vulnerable to the negative effects of COVID are those who have pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. I think it's time that we double down on making sure that we're reaching all uh, Americans in terms of improving our baseline health and our standards of care for, for all uh, people such that uh, if you do get COVID, you've got a fighting chance mm -hmm. of um, doing well and surviving it. Now that, um, I, I put a little asterisk on that because it doesn't seem like for those who are getting long COVID, there's much rhyme or reason as to who's getting it. And I think long COVID is one of those challenges that we're going to have to put a lot of research time and effort into it. Understand why it's occurring and how to prevent it because it doesn't seem to be just your pre-existing baseline health which determines whether you get long COVID and some forms of long COVID are truly debilitating. So I think that's the first thing we have to do. The second thing we have to do is uh, sort of install in Americans um, a concern for not just themselves, but other people around them. I've seen so many people say, oh, um, you know, not going someplace when I know I've tested positive, that's infringing my right of uh, free motion and free access. Whereas what I'd say is, no, it's really common courtesy that you don't want to expose other people, especially people who might be um, have fragile health to a disease that you're carrying. Mm -hmm. We just have to be uh, better about that. I think we have to be better about uh, testing ourselves. Um, I had a member of my family um, who, you know, thought she had a bad cold and then later realized it was COVID. Well, you know, test right away as soon as you're, you're, you're not healthy and then uh, self-isolate. So, I, you know, as I say, I think there are a number of things we can do, but um, what's not going to work is just continuing to shut down the country and keep students out of school. This is just um, uh, not uh, a future solution to it. So I think we're going to have to also be um, developing new vaccines as, as fast as the virus tries to evade the ones that we've got. Well, those are beautiful answers that complement much of what's been talked about already at this meeting about um, the uh, democracy of public health for everyone and also um, using knowledge to make decisions. And that kind of leads us to the next um, thing that I wanted to discuss with you, and we may open up some um, interesting topics. So the mission and objectives of the NAS. The NAS was founded to provide science advice to the nation. Today, there are three branches of the National Academies work together to provide science advice to the nation. Using valid facts to make decisions is the highlight of this meeting. How can the National Academies ensure that advice influences policy? So I love this question, Kim, because <laughs> it is, it is uh, an issue that we have been um, struggling with at the academy for quite some time. So when I first arrived as president, and I would ask my new colleagues uh, in the programs at the academy, what kind of impact are we having? I would always get anecdotes. And anecdotes are helpful because you see, wow, we did this report and um, we took it upon ourselves to self-fund it because we felt it was important and look at the important effect that it had. But as you know, anecdotes are not data and they don't necessarily point us to better strategies for getting scientific advice into the policymaking arena. So uh, what we've started doing is actually, um, first of all, recognizing that there are many ways to have impact. Uh, there, for example, um, one kind of impact could be federal money being devoted to a problem that had been overlooked. Another way to have impact is legislation that actually changes the way we govern or the way that we manage um, to be more consistent 
with what the science says will lead to positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. A third way we can um, affect uh, outcomes is just by changing the way that the public sees a problem, providing more information to them so that they understand the complexities and uh, what are more uh, useful approaches to finding solutions. And then finally, uh, one way that I um, hope we don't undervalue is the impact of a National Academy study simply to change the conversation. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, back in 2016, in the run-up to the 2016 election, the National Academy did a study on the economic and fiscal impacts of immigration. And that study changed the conversation of how we view the impacts of immigration in this country by pointing out that both the costs and the benefits of immigration are displaced in space and time. So that in the gateway communities for new immigrants, they tend to be the communities that have to invest in the social services to get the new immigrants acclimatized to, the, um, to their new country. But then the children, and that costs, that costs the gateway communities. But then the children and grandchildren of those first year immigrants pay back that investment multiple fold over. But that payback can be away from those gateway communities. It can be at the state and the federal level. So it's easy to see why there was so much debate over immigration, because where the costs are and where the benefits are don't come simultaneously in space and time. So what we've now, uh, what we're now asking our report committees to do is at the time that they complete their findings and their recommendations to actually fill out a little table of how they expect the report to have impact. What, what are they viewing as the ideal outcomes? And then we go back six months, a year, two years later, and ask the sponsors and, and uh, take a look at whether any of these impacts actually did happen. And that way we can focus our attention on the impacts that the committee actually thinks are viable and uh, important to have. So um, it's, it's a, a new process, but uh, we're, we're getting it underway. And so far, um, the feedback we're getting from the federal agencies is very positive. So I was wondering if you could um, maybe um, dive in a little deeper about two other um, issues that um, uh, NAS might um, uh, give advice about policies mm -hmm. with regard to. Uh, women's health, particularly women's reproductive health, and also climate change. So either or, or both. <laughs> oh, not shying away from any of the controversial no, topics, are we? <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's, let's talk about women's reproductive health. So the Academy already put out a study mm -hmm. a couple years ago um, on the uh, safety of abortion. And the Academy uh, determined that actually having an abortion is safer than having a baby. There are more complications per capita in childbirth than there are in abortion. However, um, we, had to, we recognized in that report that science cannot now, at least, say anything about when does life begin or what are the ethics of abortion. That has to be a topic for civil society to decide. We can say that based on safety concerns, there's no reason to uh, ban abortion. Um, there are also a number of studies that have been done on outcomes um, matching uh, communities where that have similar socioeconomic uh, circumstances, one in which abortion is freely available another where it's banned, and look at the outcomes for the women uh, who were denied abortions and what happens to them and their children. Mm -hmm. 
And the data from that show that um, there is uh, more of a burden on society in supporting the um, women who didn't want to be mothers mm -hmm. and um, the children that they didn't want to have than for a comparison group where um, women could have had an abortion but decided not to, had their children, and what are the outcomes for them and so, the children. So one other issue that I was thinking about that mm -hmm. um, expands on that is just mm -hmm. the knowledge of um, uh, basically birth control because so many things now have been learned that there are different you know, methods that one can use aside from abortion just to put off things. And I think a lot of knowledge yeah. came, uh, base came out of that study as well that you were talking exactly. about. Exactly. And, you know, in this um, context, there's a lot of similarity between climate change and um, abortion. Mm -hmm. It's much better to never have to consider an abortion at all because uh, a um, young woman was using birth control rather than having to, to face a potentially unwanted pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with climate change. It's much better not to emit the CO2 in the first place than to try to deal with it after it's in the air. Mm -hmm. So prevention is always the best solution in, um, in, in situations that are very uh, much influenced by um, ethics, morals, and mm -hmm. economics. And I think that touches on the first thing that you were saying with the first comment about educating people and broadening the education to everyone yeah. and not yes. just uh, isolated to um, communities that have and those that don't. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to go on to the next topic? Um, or you want to do more on climate change? Well, I, I could say a few things on climate change. Good. Um, you know, I, and, and again, it's one of those things, um, one of those questions where there are things that science can do, and there are things that science can't do. Um, science can clearly say that climate change is happening. Science can clearly say that um, humans are responsible for this current very rapid um, phase of climate change. We can't precisely predict the future, but we can roughly say what will happen. Those um, predictions haven't changed in almost 40 years in terms of how much warming we're going to have and the fact that um, it's going to be difficult for society to adjust. Um, and, and science can do something else. Science can work to make solutions that are acceptable, that are easy, and that are um, well um, uh, embraced by society because it makes doing the easy thing, mm -hmm. the preferred thing. Um, but, but science can't weigh things like, how much do you value the um, uh, expected consequences for developing nations that played no part mm -hmm. in the current climate crisis or very little um, versus how much do you weigh the importance of the economic vitality of your own community? Mm -hmm. um, that's something that, that, that science will not answer for society. But we can work to come up with solutions such that it's a win-win-win rather than a win-lose-lose. Lose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move to the next topic, uh, Gulf Research Program. Mm -hmm. The Gulf Research Program seems to have been a very successful in generating and part, uh, research and partnering with industry and seeing its work have a real uh, world impact, responding to spills, mitigating trash and waste, developing bacteria eating oil and plastics. What can NASEM apply from the success of this program to its other efforts? Uh, so Kim, the Gulf program is actually unique within the academies because, is, because it is the only program we have that is fully endowed through the Clean Water Act funds that came from the Deepwater Horizon spill. Mm -hmm. And that has provided a wasting endowment. We have 30 years to spend the $500 million that was given to the Academy for research in the Gulf region in three specific areas. One is environment, uh, one is oil and gas safety, 
And the third is um, broadly the health of, and of the economy and Gulf communities. So um, thanks to very um, expert investment at the Academy, even though we've been spending down this wasting endowment for um, uh, more than five years now, we actually have more money than we started with. Uh, so that means that we're gonna be actually able to do some big things in the years ahead. Uh, Lauren uh, Alexander Augustine, who leads the program, has been very uh, forceful about working with partners in the Gulf community to make sure that that research has impact and that the money is leveraged to the maximum benefit in order to make progress on those three fronts in the Gulf. And uh, I, I really think she's doing a great job. What this has led us to realize is that we need an equivalent of the Gulf program for climate change because the issues in climate change are so complex that um, trying to raise money on a project by project basis for climate change is just making progress too slow to meet the crisis. We know we've got five to 10 years to do major changes in how we emit CO2. Otherwise, um, we're, we're going to be feeling pretty terrible impacts from uh, climate change. So right now we're working to raise endowment for something we call the climate nexus. And the climate nexus is the first truly pan academy project we've undertaken because it includes climate in human health. It includes climate in infrastructure. It includes uh, climate and uh, material science and other solutions. Um, from uh, physics and chemistry. It includes climate and ecosystems. Uh, it includes uh, climate and society. So across all divisions of the, of the academy, we want to bring together the best minds in order to address this uh, multifaceted problem. Oh, that's wonderful. So one um, more uh, additional topic, and then we're going to turn to um, questions from the audience. It has to do with international engagement and support. The impact of the National Academies reaches well beyond the borders through engagement and support, which you've been doing just recently, um, to international scientific communities. And so um, uh, first, um, why is NASM engagement with international scientific community so important? And second, how can the National Academies and National Academy members support the scientific community in Ukraine, both collectively and individually? Okay, great, Kim. So let me take the first question first. Okay. Um, why is it so important that we engage internationally? Well, first of all, most of the times that the Academy is asked to do a study, uh, the statement of task is very domestically targeted. So it's what should the US be doing? What should Americans be doing? What should American agencies be doing? That sort of uh, type of study. But regardless of what the problem is, it's hard to argue that there isn't somewhere else on the planet that has already experienced this problem or is experiencing it right now or will experience it in the future. So reaching out to our international colleagues to get more perspective on it and making sure that the impacts of an academy study are also beneficial to uh, other nations um, just, just makes a lot of sense. Um, another reason why we're engaged internationally is simply in capacity building. If you look at the countries that have made the most significant gains in the 20th centuries and the 21st centuries to lift their populations out of poverty and to improve quality of life, every single one of those countries did it through investments in science and technology. Uh, look at South Korea, look at Taiwan, look at China as just some examples of countries that have used science and technology to achieve great improvements for their populations. So we want to help other nations follow that path. 
in making sure that the very best science is funded, that they have a good pipeline of human resources and uh, avoiding political interference in the science as well. So, uh, you know, those are all the reasons why we do this. We have a lot of capacity building programs. We have um, a lot of work that we do with other premier science academies just to provide advice on an international scale on things like climate change, mm -hmm. pandemics, inequality, uh, human health, et cetera. And then finally, what can individual academy members uh, do? Well, the first thing you can do is show up, just show up. It's uh, amazing how many important things we have going on that require volunteer assistance. And it's wonderful when members answer the call or volunteer to be part of uh, an international um, uh, convening or whatever. That is uh, really one way that you can support us that um, we're constantly appreciative of. Um, uh, a second very successful program we've had has been our uh, attempts to help nations where the existing scientific establishment is under great stress because of political and international um, uh, events. Uh, the first time we got involved was actually with Afghanistan, where um, as the US was withdrawing and the Taliban was taking over, it was very clear that there were scientists in that country that were going to be targets of the Taliban because of their connections to US capacity building programs, mostly through the Department of State that were administered by the National Academy. So we quickly sprang to action in order to uh, get those scientists and their families out of the country uh, any way we could. And it was a harrowing few weeks in trying to do that and then get them resettled somewhere else where they could actually continue to be part of the international scientific community until such time as it would be safe to go back to Afghanistan. I don't know when that is, but at least the people we got out are now working in universities and are respected uh, parts of the international scientific community. The more recent case, of course, is uh, Ukraine. Ukraine's a bit different because it's mainly the women scientists and their families that have had to flee the country. Um, about 50% or more than 50% of them have gone to Poland. So the National Academy of Sciences set up a joint project with the Polish Academy of Sciences, such that the Polish Academy of Sciences uh, match makes with the scientist and a Polish institution that is well suited to that scientist's uh, expertise to get them positions. And um, the US Academy of Sciences has then paid for their living stipends and travel to get to their institute and get them set up. And the institutes in Poland have been amazing. Yes. They, have, they have worked to provide um, childcare for these young mothers. They've uh, worked to find um, housing locally for them, et cetera. And I'll tell you, uh, I just got back from a trip to Warsaw and the openness and the depth of the hearts of the Polish people to help these refugees has been truly astounding mm -hmm. and something that is you know, an international new standard mm -hmm. for welcoming people who have been oppressed. Our hope, of course, is that these Ukrainian researchers will be able to return home soon. Many of them have husbands who are fighting in the war, and uh, we're hoping that it will end soon. But in the meantime, this project has been the has been supported by members, and we have never before seen members turn out in such numbers and with with substantial checks mm -hmm. to help us keep Ukrainian science alive. Yeah. Well, I was really happy that I could ask you to share that because it's just a beautiful story that 
um, that you and the Polish government have gotten together to do for these scientists. So now I'll open up for questions. If anyone has a question, if you can go to the, um, uh, yeah. they have to come up to ask a question. <laughs> so hopefully you can hear them. <laughs> okay. Well, I could in the last session, so I think it'll work. We'll see. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, John Junkins, and I'm going to ask a question that I have all of the benefits of ignorance on, uh, that yeah. I, but I, I would like to pose it. Um, I've read a study out of Purdue about a decade ago, and it was entitled Energy Corridor, uh, which is focused on the southern border of, of the United States and uh, shared with uh, Mexico, of course. And one central uh, point was if you wanted to design a optimal uh, northern hemisphere uh, location uh, to do, collect solar, the Sonora Desert uh, and points east of that all the way to Brownsville, uh, Texas uh, would be it. And the nexus of this, uh, the idea was to look at the nexus of climate, energy, and water uh, as the uh, triple challenge uh, that facing uh, our nation and a four-letter word, uh, jobs. Uh, if we were to declare uh, that we're going to do massive solar uh, on the southern border, try to engage Mexico, they have an even uh, better piece of the Sonora Desert than we do mm -hmm. uh, to do that, and use a major fraction of the solar power generated to do massive desalination of seawater mm -hmm. and uh, use the same solar energy, of course, to pump the water uh, 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 on both sides of the border. This is the idea in this mm -hmm. Purdue study. And I found that study very compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, and given that Texas has a thousand mile uh, uh, chunk of this border, uh, you know, some enterprising uh, governor might ride this to the White House. <laughs> Uh, if we get behind it and really put more teeth in it and start with a, it, it would be something it would seem that would pay by the mile if you started this uh, on the, the Brownsville area, coming along uh, desailing any water and generating uh, solar power uh, for the grid and to power the desalination mm -hmm. and really start investing in the technology <clears throat> of desalination and of course, a domestic uh, supply of uh, solar panels. If we went after this, the universities can engage, uh, we have public-private partnerships. It just seems to me like a, a very rich area and it might be something that the National Academy, uh, both of science and engineering, uh, could get behind. Uh, and maybe we could even find a former uh, senator ambassador uh, uh, Senator Hutchinson, hey, Billy Hutchinson. Ambassador Hutchinson uh, <laughs> someone who could help us navigate the politics uh, because I think um, water is the new oil and it's coming like a train uh, and to put together uh, the energy uh, generation and desalination and just think if, uh, if Mexico became energy rich by virtue of having massive solar it would change the dynamics of the border discussion. So, there are just many things, and I wanted to put that on the table and yeah. hear your response. So thank you, John, for that question. So um, uh, certainly I'll, I'll say yes to all that you said. I think this is um, a terrific idea. Um, of course, it's a complex idea. You know, we've been working trying to get just more solar and wind generation in the U.S without uh, bringing in the complexities of cross-border uh, issues as well. But um, I, I love your emphasis on the water part of it because um, there, there have been some very successful um, transboundary treaties with Mexico on water. And so um, this might be something that we could piggyback on some of those existing agreements to, um, to sort of grease the wheels. Um, the other thing I'll say about the water issue is that desalinating seawater is actually the highest energy load compared to desalinating brackish water. And that part of the Southwest US actually has a lot of brackish water that could be turned into potable water or at least water that's suitable for agricultural purposes using much less of the solar energy. And so that's why um, 
focusing on that part of the country um, does actually make a lot of sense. Of course, uh, one other thing that um, you didn't mention that also needs to be factored into this is transmission. And a similar group to the one in the paper you wrote um, talked about how uh, a focus on solar energy in the desert part of the Southwest US and Mexico would also have to connect up with um, a renewable designed grid to take wind energy from some parts of the country, solar energy from other parts of the country, and geothermal energy perhaps from uh, yet different areas, and put this all together into a renewable grid that actually takes advantage of the fact that if the sun isn't shining somewhere, the wind is blowing somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we have time for one more quick sort of question. Thank you. My name is Maria Elena Botazzi. I'm a professor at Baylor College of Medicine, but I'm also um, an emerging leader in health and medicine from the National Academy of Medicine. And also I'm privileged to be member of the National Academy of Science in Honduras. My heritage is Honduran. And I was really struck by your comments about a couple of things, certainly how to internationalize the work that we do here in the United States to serve and support and help others. And I wanted you maybe to elaborate a little bit more on that, especially taking advantage of the diaspora here in the US that represent you know, regions and other areas around the world. So how much, you know, how can we help you, know, you all, help the academies to do that? And maybe a little um, expansion of the role of women and women in leadership positions and how can we also try to continue breaking that glass ceiling, especially, again, mm -hmm. in context of, uh, of the world. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. Well, thank you for that question. Um, so let me start with um, the diaspora and how they can be helpful. Uh, we had a, we've had a, a Gates-funded capacity building uh, project with Africa. And I'll tell you, it's the diaspora in the US that has been really helpful in making those connections in uh, Africa, because these are often um, researchers working here now in the US who actually were born, uh, often educated for a good part of their schooling in Africa. They still have connections back there. They understand the challenges of working in those countries, both social, political, economic, whatever. And so um, we do take advantage of the diaspora in terms of these capacity building programs. And we are so grateful when these scientists take the time because I know many of them find that they are constantly being called upon to volunteer their time and talent with projects like this that don't necessarily advance their own careers but really make a huge difference in the careers for the next generation coming up. Um, and then uh, the second part of your question had to do with women in leadership roles. So um, let me tell you something that is totally non-scientific, but is just my um, uh, observation from having led the National Academy of Sciences for a number of years. For the full time that I have been president of the National Academy of Sciences, women have been more than 50% of the leadership group at the academy. If you look at, okay, me, the president, I'm a woman, the vice president is a woman, the home secretary is a woman. A majority of the uh, members of our council are women. And, uh, you, you might say, well, is, is that maybe unexpected? Well, I think it should be unexpected because number one, women are only, are less than 20% of the total membership of the National Academy of Sciences. So you would not expect women to be elected to leadership positions at the rate that they are just based on statistics. So why is it that a dominantly male academy elects women into the leadership role. So here comes my totally non-scientific um, hypothesis for why that happens. My view is that 
all of those men obviously had mothers. And in growing up, what they learned is that mom always put the family first. She would sacrifice what might be best for her in order for what's best for the family, even though it might mean that she wasn't cooking what she wanted to eat or she wasn't going where she wanted to go. She wasn't making decisions that benefited her. She did what was best for the family. And I think men think that women bring that to leadership roles. They check their ego at the door. They check their personal preferences at the door. They do what's best for the overall organization. So I think that's why we see women increasingly in leadership roles. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marcia, for all your time and wisdom. We really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you in the future. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Kim, for this opportunity. It's, it's always great. Tam is just such a great group, and we, we love all our members in Texas. So hello <laughs> to all of you. Thank you. Okay, bye.